We bring you greetings on behalf of the Emmerich Guazetta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We partner with a variety of uh, programs and nonprofits and religious institutions and industry partners every every week. And so this is um, a partnership with the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and Reverend Darlene Smith and Miss Dorothy Moore, who oversee the Community Cares Foundation that's affiliated with the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. So again, what an awesome opportunity for us to bring you information about stress, behavioral health, and how that coincides with our overall brain health, okay? So one thing we do uh, when we have programs is we begin with exercise because we like to say what's good for our heart is good for our brain. And so if you've been joining us on Tuesday for Emory Brain Talk Live, you will know that John Lewis starts us off with a little bit of exercise because we want you moving, we want you active. You're gonna hear all types of tips today about why physical activity is so critical to your emotional health, your mental health, your spiritual health, and your brain and heart health. So we wanna practice what we preach, and so we admonish you to get active. And what better way to do that than to have a demonstration? So if you, if this is your first time joining us or you've joined us in person, Please know that you go at your own pace. John's gonna bring lots of energy, but you go at your own pace, but we want you participating. So make some room, get ready to get physically active and join us for this demonstration. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Parker. She's gonna tell you who you can expect to hear from. She's gonna tell you a little bit about our center and then she'll introduce our lineup of speakers okay so if you have questions or if you just want to bring us a welcome greeting go ahead and post that in the chat right now without further ado i'm going to turn it over to john please get us motivated and going welcome john hey 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 i want to say welcome 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 hey i'm gonna get y'all into the weekend we're gonna work on that entire body and we're gonna work on a lot of abs because it's ab season, and I want to make sure you're ready for the beach, okay? Hey! Here we go. I want to wake you up this Friday. Woo! Let me just sit down and relax a minute. Let me tell you about it. Bye, bye. Peace. <laughs> 
don't get it. So let's get some more of that waistline.
I'm John Lewis, and see you later. Bye. All right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. As usual, round of applause to Mr. John Lewis of Energy Fitness. Our team is going to drop all of his contact information so that you can reach out to him and be a part of his fitness classes. He uh, does classes virtually and in person, but I hope you're now inspired. You have your notebook ready and your pen and pad now. Just because it's being recorded, make sure you drop, uh, jot down as many notes as you can. We want this to be an interactive session and we want you guys to come back for more because we host these types of programs weekly. So without further ado, I wanna welcome Dr. Monica Parker. She is the Outreach Recruitment and Education Corps Director, as well as our Minority Engagement Director, and she helps lead many of our outreach activities here at the Guizetta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So welcome, Dr. Parker. Welcome, Cornelia, panelists, and all public persons assembled. I'm glad that you got a chance to see John. We've always valued him, and we think he's precious and we have shared him nationally with the national audience. Um, John and I were at a gala fundraiser yesterday evening at the Washington National Portrait Gallery where Mr. John Lewis was one of the featured presenters and he was kind of like doing a mad scientist thing but he got everybody up dancing. It was really something to see and I just want you to know I came up here to support John as well as a Bright Focus Foundation. They're one of our partners in funding Alzheimer's research. That being said, um, brain health as it relates to persons of color isn't necessarily something that we always think about. And we don't always have an idea of how important overall health is, but we also don't really appreciate how poor mental health affects our physiologic function and the function of not only our brains, but our physical bodies. We have a panel assembled today. We have Dr. Sherry Broadwater, who is a nationally known and nationally awarded and recognized um, expert in psychiatric disorders, but also um, emotional health. Dr. Sherry Broadwater and her husband have their own consult holistic consulting form firm. Uh, that operates here in Atlanta and across the country. Dr. Broadwater will be followed by Dr. Eha Pajar, who is an internal medicine geriatric medical provider who serves as a clinical trials unit director for our Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He's conducted a number of studies studying the impact of cardiovascular disease, i.e. hypertension, and its effect on brain and brain function. We will also be followed by Dr. Lakeisha Izzard, who is a licensed uh, counselor operating in, um, I want to say, De DeKalb and Rockdale counties, who's going to talk to us about counseling services. We'll also have Dr. Melody, I'm sorry, Melody, I'm blanking just a minute, I'm looking at two different places, who's going to give us some healthy tips on diet and nutrition. Um, at this time, I'd like to call on Dr. Sherry Broadwater to begin her presentation. So Crystal is going to be bringing up my slides and I'm just gonna be commenting on a couple of things while she's doing that. One is um, about mushrooms and even um, ketamine and, and um, even herbal supplements just sort of, sort of overall, because we have to remember that um, herbal supplements are not regulated in, in any way, that there's no governing body that is ensuring that herbal supplements have gone through the rigorous practice of review. And so that means that they've been tested on X amount of people, like um, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 before they get to the market. So they haven't. And so um, manufacturers can say what they want to say about on the, on the bottle or even in advertising. Um, and so we do have to be careful. And how, what I say to my parents, I mean, my patients and my clients, um, I don't want people to have to take anything if they don't need to. And what we're finding is even with, even with cannabis uh, use for, for different disorders that 
um, especially for PTSD and depression and anxiety, that we don't find sustaining improvement. Uh, it causes it, it creates um, immediate acute uh, uh, reduction of symptoms, but it doesn't it doesn't create the ongoing long term effects so that people are still having to do it and smoke it. Or, 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 or eat it or inhale it every day. I have no disclosures or conflicts or in, conflicts of interest. I'm gonna say thank you to everyone, family, friends, mentors. And these are my nieces. I also offer group therapy. Next slide. Oh, I wanted to say, make sure you follow me at Dr. Sherry Sykes, D-R-S-H-E-R-R-I-P-S-Y-C-H on Facebook and on Instagram, Dr. Sherry Sykes. My website is drsherrysyke.net. And what do I do? Let me just say a bit about me really quickly. Um, I specialize in supporting and helping cis and trans women of color transform frustration, chaos, and pain to health, wealth, joy, and safety through my psychiatric practice. I have a practice in um, Atlanta by Grant, Grant Park, and um, I'm still virtual in my um, social media speaking, and I have several books coming out. Okay, so we know what stress is, but I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit more about it because Dr. Hijar talked about it, but I wanted to give the categories. There's, um, it's new stress and distress. And oftentimes we don't talk about the two different categories, like getting married can be a very positive thing, and, but it can still cause some, some inner anxiety. Um, and just like Dr. Hajar said, that youth stress can can motivate us, um, uh, helps to focus our energy. Um, it can feel exciting, um, just like in, in before a presentation. I mean, you, I, you know, before I felt a little stressful, but uh, and also it can improve performance. Distress is negative stress, so that causes anxiety or concern, can be short or long-term, is perceived as outside of our coping abilities, feels unpleasant, decreases performance, and can lead to mental and physical problems. So next slide, please. There are a variety of symptoms, and it's not just symptoms, but experiences, um, feelings, Body, body changes associated with stress. So just take about 15 seconds to look at this slide and say, you know, and see if, see if any of these, these behavior changes or physiological changes resonate with you in terms of your mind, um, your, what you feel. When I think about, about emotions, I think emotions <clears throat> is in the body. <clears throat> Feelings is more here. Emotions is in the body. Behaviors and even... Um, body symptoms, because we know that African-American women and women of, and Latino women are more psychosomatic. So we <clears throat> often experience our stress in our bodies. That's neck pain, that's um, headaches, that's stomach pain. Next slide. Some examples of uh, the stress causes an increase in, cor in cortisol hormones, which is a natural bodily response. And Stress hormones are good things. They help to restore balance in the body. They help regulate blood sugars in cell, cells. And like Dr. Hajar said, they help to uh, mediate the hippocampal activities and that's where memory is stored. Next slide. So 30 seconds on this slide. Examples of positive stress, examples of negative stress. And I want you to count through, let's, uh, let's say in the last six months, how many of us have experienced uh, positive stressors? How many positive stressors have you experienced? And, um, and also over the last six months, during the last six months, how many negative uh, stressors have you experienced? And put that in the chat if you are so moved, um, if you're feeling... Um, yeah, I want to say vulnerable, but you're willing to expose what that is. And so I'm going to, I'm going to also count mine down as well.
Ooh, so well, this is telling for me. I don't know what else, what what other people. Oh yeah, so uh, 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 Aaron says she can't even count the number of negative stressors. I was uh, I'm in agreement. I was looking at I was staring at positive stress. I'm like, what else have I done? I bet think I just have one taking a vacation. Maybe really not. Oh, but then the you know the pandemic, the death of a loved one. So that many of us are extremely, extremely, extremely stressed, and and that's next slide. So it is important to recognize that the stressors that we are next slide. Go back one. Go back one. The stressors that we are experiencing are causing this. This is what is, is causing this. Even if we don't feel it at the conscious level or experience it at the conscious level that we are aware of what's going on, our body is still affected by this. And the stresses are causing, are causing physiological changes that cause the internal damage that is sudden or is, 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 is unknown to us until after. Okay, next slide. There's some additional um, stressors that we really need to be aware of. Stressors don't have to be external, outside. They can be internal. Perfectionistic expectations, repetitive thought patterns, um, fears, worrying about future events. So it's worrying about future events and also going back to the past. Future and the past and habitual behavior, um, behavior patterns. Next slide. Expect some stress, let it go. But sometimes many of us are so overwhelmed we can't. Next slide. I'm gonna go to the I'm gonna go to the last slide. I mean the last bullet first on the right hand right hand side. Yes. I think some of us have gone for years, absolutely. Chronic, chronic stress can cause chronic inflammation. So that is the issue. So when we are stressed for too long, then our cortisol levels, which are typically used to help us manage stress, it becomes so dysregulated and disrupted that it just goes haywire. And then that haywire um, cortisol response causes inflammation, and that is the driver of cardiovascular, one of the drivers of cardiovascular disease, autoimmune diseases. This is why lupus, which is auto, autoimmune disorder, and, and is disproportionately affects Black women and women of color, and it also increases our risk of dementia. So this is why we have to treat it. We, this is why you, we have to treat chronic depression. We have to, we have to treat depression. Because we don't treat depression because of the inflammation. That's a driver to dementia. Chronic stress, again, can affect our memory. Chronic stress can cause structural brain damage. And what does chronic stress do? It also, um, it, it, it stops us from utilizing our normal coping activities. And then what happens? And then we stop doing what we'd like to do, what we normally do, and then we get depressed, more depressed, and then we stay depressed, and then we, it's, it's, a, it's a nasty cycle. And chronic diseases problems are defined as one, one year or more. Next slide. One more back, one, one back, one more, one back. This is how I think about uh, how do we reduce stress. My definition of self-care is any and all tools needed to create and maintain mental, emotional, physical, financial, environmental, sexual, and spiritual health. Any and all tools, any and all tools. Next slide. First of all, we have to be aware of it. We have to be aware of what is, what is stress. What is it? What are the examples of it? What is, what is, what's positive and what is negative? What are we experiencing that's chronic? The pandemic has been chronic. That means we have to be, we just, we have to be aware that we are chronically impacted by it could be. And that means we have to leave space for wellness and healing. We have to, we have to create wellness and healing opportunities. 
within our lives. As black women, many of us experience the strong black woman syndrome. Make sure I say that the strong black women syndrome or the super black woman syndrome, which is what we overdo, we over schedule, we are over, um, uh, over creating, not taking care of ourselves, putting other people's needs first, first, second, third, our needs are last. We're often managing our feet, our, um, our stress through eating or shopping or uh, media or the external fixation and can feel, feel very guilty about taking care of the self. I don't hear it. Do we have any comments, any comments in the chat? I don't, I wish, I wish we were in person because I just love, I love talking about this. In a, this unwillingness, in, in unwillingness to set boundaries, not, not learning, not knowing how to, not taking time to, um, what we can do to reestablish wellness right now. It goes back to, what is that book? What is that book? I, 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 everything I knew, I learned in kindergarten. When we were five, what did we have to do? You had to get up on time. You had to eat. You had breakfast. You did what you had to do, lunch and snack. And then dinner, you did your work, you got playtime, you had, you prepped for bed, you went to bed at a reasonable time. That's a basic routine that we had done, we did for years that we don't do, most, many of us don't do anymore. So if we could just, just start doing that, that could be um, transformative. Problem solving, speaking up, increasing skills. Coping skills, Dr. Hadar mentioned mindfulness, coping skills, coping skills. People need at least 20. You need at least 20 coping skills. And it, it, matching, matching the need that you have, that's, that's, my, that's being grounded, that is self-love, that is distraction. Most of us have three or four. We need at least 20, at least 20 different coping skills. And then also a part of self-care is help seeking behavior, is being willing to ask for help, being willing to move out of ourselves and seek um, support. And if we are uncomfortable, because a lot of us, because of our past, are uncomfortable asking for help, then that is where the intervention is, is how do I address, address my uh, trauma trust issue, my that abandonment rejection um, uh, stuff from the past. That's usually the past, but it could be from a little girl. Those addressing, y'all see my little baby here, I love her. Addressing my childhood uh, injuries so that I can be well, so that the inflammation that is um, experienced because of the trauma, I can decrease, which will then decrease the impact of cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disorders, um, chronic depression and anxiety, and dementia, dementia. My grandma um, passed from uh, dementia, so I, it's very close to me. So I, I'm very aware of that. And also, let me say, let me apologize. I said committed suicide in the, in the beginning. It's not, suicide is not a crime. It is completed suicide. Um, that's it. Next slide, one more thing. Next slide. What are some examples? Humor, humor. One thing we have to be able to do, um, this is my last, this last 30 seconds, uh, be able to experience a variety of feelings. So we're able to experience joy and sadness and anger and excitement and fear. If you find yourself stuck in one or two of, of those feelings and you can't shift, then that's an issue. Some people who are too happy are denying the sadness and anger. Some people who are angry and, angry and fearful are denying happiness and joy. We must learn how to experience all the feelings. Hydration, we need to make sure we're drinking enough water because what happens, um, water flushes out fat and um, it helps to just modulate the body. Safety, using our voice, that's it. All right, ladies, th ladies and gents, thank you so much. And hyper, yes, yes, hypertension tension and do strokes, which can lead to dementia. Dementia, where can we find help? This is a slide. Please feel free to take a, uh, take a picture of it. Thank you so much, Dr. Broadwater, for those very keen insights. And I think that um, 
and thank you also for that information there. Um, I think it's really important for a lot of us to appreciate, and I like the way that you attack the superwoman kind of syndrome that most mothers and working professional women face, regardless of what our colors are, our issues are right. the same. Uh, it doesn't matter whether I'm a rock star or superstar scientist or I am a hospital uh, laundress. If I have children at home that I need to feed, my issue is I need to get home to feed them. I need to get their schedule straight. And there's not enough hours in the day to do all the stuff that I need to do. So I think yeah. the myth of the superwoman is alive and well. And you're giving us permission not to be superwomen. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. And let me just say, uh, I am symbolic of the permission uh, because, at the, you know, we're working on finding our own voices, so we know that we are we can we give ourselves permission. So I'm a, we're symbolizing we're symbolizing you people learning women learning how to give themselves permission, authority, autonomy to make the decisions they need to make to, do, um, to be healthy. Thank you, ladies and gents. Any if no questions. Then I will see you all later. Thank you, Dr. Broadwater. Okay, so um, thanks for uh, th thanks for having me, and uh, I hope everyone is having a wonderful morning. So I was tasked with um, going over and discussing some of the issues that um, affect uh, brain health from exposure to stress standpoint, and how it correlates with or relates to the cardiovascular system and in turns how it can affect our brain health. Um, next slide. So, uh, Crystal, okay, okay great. Um, so I, uh, I, always I always like to start my presentation on stress with the uh, kind of an overview of the amount of stress that we are surrounded with and I think uh, none, none of us would argue and no one would argue that there is just an unbelievable amount of stress that keeps exponentially increasing over, over time. So um, a lot of stress can be related to our financial situation, whether it is currently or past or, or worrying about the future or the future of our kids or what not, there is a, a, this is a big source of stress to almost everybody. Um, uh, I don't know what's happening here. Uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. There, there's a, a, something on my screen, I don't know. Uh, okay, never mind. Um, uh, other a big other another big source of stress is our jobs. So almost um, any job, no matter how uh, stress free it it is advertised to be, there's always a high level of a high a big an important source of stress for us. So whether it is uh, our task that we are assigned to do, or whether it is worrying about a boss that's breathing down our necks or whether it is uh, job security or whether being on time or whether, uh, so all of these issues are definitely a big source uh, of stress. And then another area of a uh, source of stress is caregiving and uh, caregiving could be either related to children or caring for an older, uh, an older parent or a, a, per, a, or a uh, partner or a person uh, who has some medical or other types of disability or, or, or issues. And then obviously the big, uh, the big element in, in our recent, uh, the last couple of years is the uh, pandemic and the exposure to COVID. And that has carried with itself a, a whole set of stressors that have uh, also been um, extremely powerful in affecting our um, our um, our environment and our psyche, <clears throat> and then uh, obviously dependent on what minority you belong to, uh, whether it is uh, a racial minority or a sexual minority or a national minority or 
whatever minority you might be in, there's always this individual and system uh, dif- discrimination that one can experience, either related to injustices or the way people may be, uh, or the way the environment or the society may be dealing with uh, with that with that minority, and that leads to a lot of uh, either micro or macro aggression and. If you are exposed to it frequently, that leads to a almost a syndrome similar similar to the chronic stressors that we deal with in the other areas. Now, why is it important, and why is a doctor talking to you about stress? Is because it's uh, has been well documented through uh, through in the past that ex- chronic and recurrent exposure to stress uh, is linked to many of the major cardiovascular and other related issues. For example, hypertension has been well known to be, if you have a recurrent exposure to stress that uh, your system, the system can be, can develop persistent elevation in blood pressure and leads to hypertension. Uh, Obesity and uh, obesity from stress could be both a physiological response to stress, but also emotional response to stress. So, uh, I'm a person that when I'm stressed out, I reached out to the refrigerator and I feel like whenever I'm stressed, my diet goes, um, it goes south. And that's, um, I believe is not a unique situation. That's an, a, a pretty much a, a consistent or a persistent response that we all, a lot of people have. But more importantly, it's, I think exposure to stress chronically leads to significant brain issues and the more com- most common of those is memory decline. And we all have been in situations where, uh, at least I have, where I've been extremely stressed. And for some reason uh, that I will talk about later, that I feel like my memory and my attention and my focus is out. of um, is, um, is out. And I feel very, dis- dis- um, uh, my focus becomes very, very difficult. And then if that's, uh, if exposure to stress has been persistent for a while, then it calls, it leads to accelerated aging, which uh, obviously is leading, leads also by itself to many of the comorbidities and the diseases that we deal with, with, with age. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, this is, uh, I'm not going to go over the details in this slide, but this is to give you a little bit of an idea of how stress can affect our brain. So. Uh, as I said, chronic stressors, which are on the um, on the left side of your screen, there is uh, can lead to a lot of issues such as sleep problems, uh, dietary issues, uh, mental health, and emotional distress. And these leads to hormonal changes as well as uh, cardiovascular changes in our system. And eventually, it leads to uh, the usual stress response, which is an elevation in cortisol levels. Uh, this leads to um, a, a whole array of things that are not great for our brain and eventually leads to neuronal changes, which means that the brain by itself will be affected and damaged uh, chronically by the stress, by the stress uh, response. And what does that manifest? It, uh, we are less attentive. Uh, we have short-term memory loss. Uh, you know, you left your key somewhere and you can't remember where you, where you left them. You parked your car. I uh, don't remember where you parked your car. That could be a manifestation of excessive exposure to stress. Um, some word finding, uh, names, et cetera. All of these could manifest from a chronic exposure of, of stress. <clears throat> Next slide. So... Um, this is, uh, this is an important study, I think, that I always love to show because it's, it gives us a little bit of an, a, an explanation of what has happening in our brain when we are exposed to stress. And um, the good news about this study is that the, it shows that when you re- alleviate the stressor response, uh, some of the changes that occur in the brain may be improved uh, and elevated. So there is a, a kind of hope that if we are better able to cope with stress, or if we are able to decrease stress within our, you know, as much as we can, there is a possibility that the things that we, the brain manifestations of the stress will be, uh, will be reversed. And what you're seeing here are two, two brains. One is a, a stressed brain and one is on unstressed brain. The stressed brain is the one in the red 
it's on your right side and the left is on the on the uh, green one is on the uh, on the left side and uh, what we like to see in the brain when we talk about connective, you know, so the, the so-called wiring of the brain, I'm sure you've heard of that term, is the more wires and the more wiring you have, the better the brain is functioning. And um, a healthy brain will have a lot of wires that are interconnected together so that, we can, that it can function properly. But what happens is, and this study shows that when people are, when individuals are exposed to chronic stress that is repeatedly uh, affecting them, the number of networks that are in our brain sh decreases. And a lot of these connections are connected to the center where, where it's an emotional control, uh, which we call the frontal lobe, which is basically the frontal part of the brain that controls our uh, emotions, our mood, our uh, social, uh, our, our um, uh, impulse control, <clears throat> excuse me, impulse control. And that is probably why when we are stressed, we tend to do things that otherwise we wouldn't do. Um, and people deal with stress in different ways. Uh, some people eat a lot, so they gain weight. Some people shop, some people do a, uh, <clears throat> other kind of uh, uh, sexual behavior that otherwise have difficult to control. So these are all um, could be an a manifestation of the disruption in these uh, frontal lobe network. Next slide. So uh, with, uh, I don't wanna leave you with all this doom and gloom kind of thing about stress because stress, unfortunately, no matter what environment and society you live in, uh, wherever in uh, uh, setup you are in, stress is a part is part of life. And really, there I, I can't imagine any situation all the way from initial humanity till now that we weren't exposed to stress. And in fact, a little bit of stress is important. It's not it's not that uh, it's all bad. I think a little bit of stress can push us sometimes, can let make us uh, improve and and cope and strengthen our. Um, our uh, uh, mental approach to things. <clears throat> but I think uh, the more important and the more uh, critical thing is to learn how to cope with stress because you, you cannot change the things you cannot control, uh, unfortunately. You can't control the mass shooting. These are not going to be, I, I or you maybe can politically change it uh, or, as, you know, mental health or whatever, but. Um, I think overall, that what we have what we have control over how we react to things. If you are stuck in traffic or running late, and you're feeling that you're getting too stressed, and your blood pressure is going up, and you're breathing hard, and, and all that, you cannot make you cannot do anything about that because eventually the traffic you're going to reach your destination. And so instead of being stressed and losing health. Um, health credit, I guess what I call it on that, I think you can focus on decreasing the stress response. And there are various things that you can do even now. Um, we know that if you, when you are stressed and you spend some time doing some deep breathing exercises, um, that helps. Um, if you, uh, imagery therapy, uh, all of us have certain points in our memories, in our past, uh, that we find very um, relaxing and useful uh, to help to lower or improve our moods and trying to um, call on these images, uh, experiences. These all help. Um, a lot of people, including myself, I find going back to my childhood home relaxes me. And whenever I stress or find myself getting into that situation, I always um, uh, go back to that point. And it seems uh, it helps sometimes. Uh, a lot of us are spiritual people, um, are um, uh, talking, uh, uh, use uh, prayers and faith to help us with dealing with stress. That's very effective. Uh, we talked, uh, we had a session on exercise, improving your social interaction, talking to friends, talking to family members, having a confidant that you can share your stressors and things that stress you out uh, and help you kind of process through them, um, uh, possibly getting a, a counseling or talking to a therapist if that's an option or a feasible uh, 
situation for yourself. And then I think the probably the most critical element that I find very helpful for me personally is understanding and recognizing what are my triggers. And, you know, if you cannot change the trigger, maybe a trigger avoidance can sometimes be helpful. Uh, you know, if Thanksgiving going to, um, you know, if, th if Thanksgiving and going, and going to your family reunion um, stresses you out uh, a lot, maybe, maybe uh, you know, trying to not go every year. Or if, um, you know, going through traffic and being late is a stressor, then try to leave the house 10 minutes earlier. Uh, so recognizing the trigger is probably the first element and the first part um, uh, the first part for, for handling stress. Um, I think one of the, uh, and before I close, I, you know, one of the things that I, I, that, that I found myself is that we're surrounded by this high level of knowledge um, onslaught. You know, we have news going on in TV, on the phone, on the computer. And I could tell you that, that listening to the news and hearing the news continuously is a big societal risk because everybody is so stressed out about the news um, that I think that's causing a lot. <laughs> I mean, that is not proven by science, but I think it's my theory is that it's causing a lot of the, the universal level of high, uh, high stress in our, in our communities. But I'm sure there are other levels, uh, other areas that you might find work for you. So not only recognizing what the triggers are, but also making sure that uh, you, you kind of find a way to deal with it and, and, and be it on the forefront of your, uh, of your, of your brain, because it's very important to uh, not, only, not only recognize stress, but before you get to the physiological abnormal response, that is when you, before you get to the point where your blood pressure is going up and your heart rate is, is going up, uh, making sure you address it. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I think you will uh, probably have heard in these sessions or will hear in these sessions is this concept of mindfulness, which is very much the idea of recognizing where you are and how to avoid these situations. And this is a kind of a nice uh, kind of last slide here is to kind of give you the spectrum of moods that we are we can be in, and uh, again, one of the initial uh, approaches to this is to recognize where you are on this spectrum, and if that's a, a negative has a negative uh, impact on you and your health, and try to avoid that and move it in an opposite or a different direction. And I think I'll stop here. Do we take questions now, uh, Dr. Parker, or do we? Yeah, why don't you? I think there are a few in there, and Dr. Broadwater asks a very important question about neuroplasticity. I think the steps you proposed for stress reduction are important. There's some questions in there about herbal remedies. Can you comment on what neuroplasticity um, is? Yeah, so neuroplasticity is uh, our, you know, the, the easiest way to explain neuroplasticity, and maybe others have better ways to explain it, I think is plasticity is our ability of being resilient to the um, to the to the uh, to the stressors that we have that we are exposed to. So, um, if we are if we are able to deal with the stress in a way that instead of being you know extremely stressed about the triggers, but just kind of over time develop a way where you become more resilient and more resistant. Uh, to these, then your brain is going to gain a, a power to be able to fight that. And that's in some way considered neuroplasticity. Um, uh, another question I think was about herbal uh, remedies uh, to help with stress. Um, I'm not sure which herbal remedies uh, the, uh, 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 the gentleman or uh, person is asking. Um, so I, I'm a familiar a little bit uh, with the literature about there are certain mushrooms or mushroom related products that have been advertised as anxiolytics. And anxiolytic is a medicine that helps with anxiety. 
Uh, I believe those have been uh, quite uh, uh, aggressively advertised for um, for stress and how to deal with stress. Um, I, I don't, I'm not f very familiar with the evidence. I think there is probably some small studies that have suggested uh, uh, that uh, these might help with the uh, response to stress, but uh, I'm not sure that they are um, kind of the answer to the situation. I'd rather probably uh, invest my time and money on something more uh, more effective for me rather than to try an herbal remedies. Also, a lot of these drugs that are supplements that have been advertised for stress, it turns out they have a, quite a bit of liver toxicity. So I would be a little careful about using them. Um, Thank you, Dr. Pajar. I really appreciate that. And just for the benefit of those people who are on the call, we are going to be doing a study in the Department of Psychiatry on psilocybin, which is mushrooms, a mushroom derivative, on how that improves people's uh, reaction to chronic diseases like cancer and other things. But I think that, as you pointed out, the research, the data on these herbal things is is small. So I'd be very careful about investing in them. Okay. Can everybody see clearly? Yes, ma'am. All right. Wonderful. Well, good morning, you all. And again, I am Dr. LaCletia Izzard, and I am a licensed professional counselor, and I have been in clinical mental health counseling for close to 20 years, 17 years now. And yes, I know that I look very youthful, but I started out even younger. So I'm excited to talk about this topic today as it relates to our young people, youth trauma and the brain, especially concerning considering all of the trauma that we are currently seeing in our society and where we currently are now, just as a nation as a whole, as it relates to mental health. I also serve on the board of directors for the National Alliance for Mental Illness. So I always share this with individuals. Mental health is not just my background. It's not just my passion, but literally it is my gift to share with the world. So I'm excited to share with you all today. When we look at implications for young people, our children and our youth, I thought this was a very, very good quote to kind of sum it up. Some of the things we probably don't always think about as it relates to our babies. And you'll hear me say that too a little bit interchangeably. But this is Dr. Bruce Perry, and he is at the Trauma and Brain Development Center. And this is what he said. He said, experience can change the mature brain but experience during the critical periods of early childhood organizes the brain. So I think that's very important that we think about that as it relates to trauma and when it happens to our young people, as it relates to mental health challenges and conditions, when our young people are experiencing that. Because when it looks at the effects of the brain, we're starting to get into organizing of brain systems. And I also was a special ed teacher in the middle school setting. So I was really able to see how those young people were challenged as it related to their academics, their learning ability, their memory, all of those things, because these particular children had traumatic backgrounds. Okay. Moving forward, as we look at the adolescence, adolescent stage and years, and I even remember when I was working on my master's degree in mental health counseling at the largest HBCU in the nation, which is North Carolina a and State University. But I remember sitting in some of those classrooms and listening to my professors and even reading some of the literature, and they started to talk about adolescence in some of my courses. And I can remember even then being shocked at the range that adolescence actually goes up to because many of us are looking at it as young adults, but some of these individuals are actually literally still in the adolescence phase. So we'll talk about that in the next slide, but just wanted to give a quick overview for you of what the adolescent stage is. And literally adolescence is a transitional phase of growth, okay? And development between childhood and adulthood. Okay. Adolescence can be a time of both disorientation and discovery. 
I think that's important when we're talking about our young people because we really have to have a greater awareness and understanding of where they are mentally and even where they are emotionally. Yeah. This transitional period can raise questions of independence. Mm -hmm. We notice that if we think about some of our youth that are that age and some of the questions they ask and some of the things that they're ready to do at that particular age range, we realize that they're looking for their independence. And then identity, absolutely. As adolescents cultivate their sense of self, these are just some areas that they may face difficulty in, okay? Their academics, okay? Relationships with their peers, Yes, even their sexuality and their gender. And yes, even testing with substances. Okay. When we look at the stages of adolescence, and that's what I was referring to about kind of being shocked even when I was sitting in those classrooms as a student in counseling, this is still new to us, I think sometimes when we're thinking about adolescence, but this is still a little bit of new research too because of currently where we are. But the stages of adolescence includes ages 10 to 14, okay? That's considered early adolescence. And then we have mid-adolescence, which is from age 15 to 17, okay? And then we have late adolescence from age 18 to 26. Again, think about some young people that you know. I have nieces, I have nephews, I have baby cousins, young youthful cousins. And I think about some of the challenges that their parents have discussed and talking about some of the things that they've shared and some of the decisions and choices that they're making within this age group. And especially when they hit this 24, 25, 26 range, it's almost like, well, why are they still doing certain things or why are they thinking like this or why are they making these kind of choices? Well, you still have an adolescent. You still have an adolescent. So I think those are just things for us to keep in mind. As we start to move forward and talking about mental health and talking about trauma as it affects our young people's brain, this is, I think, was a great uh, quote too as well from Dr. Perry. He said, as the brain is organizing, it's waiting for the world to tell it how to structure itself. As the brain is organizing, it is waiting for the world to tell it how to structure itself. So as we think about, again, those adolescent stages that I just talked about and talking, thinking about that young person and as their brain is developing, as they're going through these difficult stages of identity and making these different decisions and, and wanting their independence and all of these things, think about some of their influences that are out there in society and in the world. And that's why it's so important that we begin to look more closely at trauma and how it's affecting our young people. Because this particular generation has seen more trauma than any other generation in history. Just wanted to do another quick review for you as it relates to mental illness again, because I think sometimes we hear mental health and we hear mental illness all the time. And sometimes these terms are used interchangeably. But as we're thinking about young people, we really have to remember and keep in mind what mental illness actually is and what it affects. So mental illness is a condition, number one, that affects that young person or that individual's thinking, their feelings, how they behave, and their mood. And that's something that I always remember when I was a special education teacher in the middle school setting. Some of my parents would always say, well, why are they making some of these behavior choices or why are they doing some of these things? Well, it is a part of what they're experiencing as it relates to their mental health condition or their mental health challenge. And when a young person is experiencing a mental health disorder like that or a challenge, they're having difficulty with communicating to their parents and the adults in their life about how it's really affecting them and how it's hurting them. And so many times we'll see that come out in their behavior, okay? These conditions deeply impact the day-to-day -day living. When a young person has a mental health challenge, you're gonna see their functioning decrease, okay? 
And I think that was Dr. Broadwater that spoke about having a routine. Even as a young person, when we think about that, we had naps, we got up at breakfast, we had lunch, we had dinner, we had these great routines. And anytime you see that routine being disrupted in that young person, that's letting you know that something more is going on with your young person. And especially a young person that has a traumatic background, they may have difficulty with routine. Now that doesn't mean that you still don't work toward keeping them on a routine because young people need consistency. They need stability. They need security, absolutely. But this is just one of the signs and the ways that you can tell if something more is going on with your young person when they're not able to follow those routines or they're having challenges with following those routines. Okay. And mental health conditions absolutely are far more common than most individuals think, especially among young people. Okay. A mental health condition can have multiple linking causes. I think that's important for us to see too, because sometimes individuals think it may just be this one traumatic experience, or it may just be this one event or this one thing that happened. And that's not to say that that doesn't connect to mental illness, but it's also important to know that there can be multiple linking causes, okay? Such as genetics, such as their environment, okay? All of this can influence whether or not that young person or this individual develops a mental health condition. Here are some great stats I think that are important for us to also keep in mind. One in six youth in America, ages six to 17, experience a mental health condition, okay? One in six each year. That's a number for us to really take to heart because that is an alarming number, okay? 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by the age of 14 and 75% by the age of 24. Think about those stages I just talked about, about adolescence. That's it. That's right there when a young person is in the heart of adolescence. 14 and 24, 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by age of 14 and 75% by age of 24. And something else I'll remember. As a board member serving on NAMI, we speak a lot about our loved ones that have mental health challenges, whether they've been diagnosed or not. <laughs> and as we think about in the African-American community, we know that we still have some stigma within our community as it relates to mental illness. And so I can remember being a young girl and one of my close loved ones and my grandmother sharing about how one of my close loved ones, they took her to mental health at a very young age, they took her at 14. And much of my family members, we joke and we said, well, why didn't they take her back to get treatment? <laughs> Indeed, but again, during that time period, there was no talk as much about mental health. And if they did, it was kind of shunned, okay? They didn't speak much about it. Even if they learned that something more was going on, they felt that they could handle it as a family, okay? So these are just things to keep in mind as we look at our young people and the signs and symptoms as it relates to the onset period. Adolescents and mental health risk factors. Now, these are the risk factors that can contribute to that young person having a mental illness, okay? So SAMHSA puts it like this. Risk factors include genetics, again, can be biological or physiological, environmental, and yes, absolutely, cultural considerations. We're seeing more of that now with our racial injustices. And I have that down here as well. Racial trauma that our young people of color are hearing about, they're seeing, okay? When they see our beautiful black men being murdered on video, on the television, how do we think that affects them, okay? So looking a little bit closer at some of these areas, just for example, when we look at genetics, family history of mental illness, okay? That's gonna be a risk factor. Chronic stress over time, Dr. Broadwater and, uh, Broadwater and the other doctor, they spoke a great deal about chronic stress and did a great job. But yes, it contributes to anxiety and depression in young people, severe depression actually, okay? And then here we go, trauma. 
adverse childhood experiences. And many of you want to learn more about adverse childhood experiences. I'm not going to have time to dive deep into it today, but please go to the CDC website. It is a public health issue. It includes trauma such as violence, neglect, sexual and physical abuse, even cyberbullying, divorce. All of these are trauma experiences that our young people can experience that will connect them and put them at risk for having a mental health disorder, a mental illness. And the CDC also reports and speaks that it decreases their lifespan by 20 years. So we're talking a lot about dementia, but our young people that are experiencing trauma and mental health disorders, many of them may not even get to an elderly age, okay? Because something will have intervened and happened before they will even get to that age group that will cause them to no longer be here. And I think it was Dr. Broadweather that mentioned the correct language. We're now saying ended their life by suicide, okay? And yes, racial trauma, discrimination, and identity issues are high risk factors for mental health in adolescents. Looking a little bit more in depth at trauma and the brain and the specific areas, okay? The amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. These are the three main areas that trauma stress affects, okay? Trauma stress activates the amygdala. It activates it. And the amygdala is considered to be the brain's alarm system, okay? It's responsible for activation of appropriate fear-related behaviors and emotions. So think about when these things are challenged. And then the hippocampus, traumatic stress, it shrinks the hippocampus. This is the part of the brain, again, that's responsible for learning and memory. Think about them being in school and needing to be able to concentrate on their academics. And then lastly, traumatic stress can decrease the function in the prefrontal cortex, okay? This is responsible for the attention, impulse response, and even cognition processes, okay? So then their thinking is disrupted, their decision-making, okay? This is just a quick picture of an 11-year-old here that has chronic PTSD, okay? The smaller areas, is the picture of the brain that has the PTSD. And then the larger is the one that is more of the healthier. Okay. Adolescent's response as a result of trauma effects on the brain. This is critical because this is how we see and know that that trauma is affecting their brain. The learning is negatively impacted so you're going to see poor concentration in your young person. You're going to see distraction. You're going to see inability to retain information. You're going to see poor peer relationships. You're going to see possibly aggressive behaviors, some violence, okay? Impulse control. Again, thought processing challenges, being able to make appropriate decision-making, inappropriate fear and emotional responses, not quite sure how to respond to fear and threats that they believe are around them because of the trauma that they've experienced. And here we go, suicidal ideation, absolutely. And that can lead to severe depression. Whenever a child has severe depression or a young person, we know that they may experience suicidal ideation. And when they have a traumatic background, absolutely. And I think it's important for us to know this alarming statistic. Suicide is currently the second leading cause of death from ages 10 to 34. So that is that adolescent age range is right within there. And even more so for our young African-American males. So I think that's important for us to keep in mind. And I'm pretty much done. These were just some areas right here that I wanted you all to be able to take a look at. A 22 year old young man has a history of physical abuse. These are some of the areas we can see. 12-year-old, if they're having issues, sexual abuse, these are some of the areas that they experience emotionally and fear. And so these were just some areas, you all. So I hope all of that was helpful to you as we look at trauma and a young person and helping them to cope. One of the big things I would say is awareness, okay? 
So being a part and joining organizations like NAMI, Mental Health America of Georgia. Also, I do trainings for foster and adoptive parents for the Georgia Resource Centers of Support. They're a great also resource to have. Other social skills, making sure your young person has those, that sense of belongingness, that love, that support support groups. NAMI does that well, youth support groups. And then, of course, what some of our other panelists spoke about, that faith piece, and then, of course, mindfulness and meditation. All right, you all. And lastly, just wanted you all to know that the greatest natural power of humankind is the power of the human brain. So absolutely, we want to protect and take care of our young people's brain. Again, I am Dr. LaCletia Izzard. If you would like to reach me on social media, please can follow me at Dr. LaCletia Izzard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Um, there's certainly a lot of information that we have to use, and these slides um, and presentations will be made available um, at the conclusion of this program um, to people who have signed up through Eventbrite. If you have questions for Dr. Izzer, please put it in the chat. At this time, we'll turn over to our last presenter, Ms. Melody Powers. Uh, Barnes, excuse me, our nutritionist, who's going to talk to us about stress and diet. Good morning, and um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, inviting me on, on this esteemed panel. Um, got a lot of great information today. I am Melody Charles. I am a registered. I've been a registered dietitian for a little over ten years, and I'm also a physician associate in women's health. So I talk about stress and diet every day in my practice. Next slide. All right, so we've all kind of been here, I think. Um, emotional eating is basically a term used to uh, describe using food as a mechanism, mechanism to soothe or to suppress negative emotions, whether it be stress, depression, anxiety, boredom, loneliness, anger, or hanger, um, or fatigue, we typically tend to lead to comfort foods, right, to um, basically soothe our emotions or make us feel better, essentially. We do know also that aside from negative emotions and kind of what I learned today, positive, um, positive stressors, we use food for um, happy moments, right? And celebratory things. So I can think of a time like when I was a kid and I had um, straight A's on my report card. My dad, it never failed. We go through a drive through I get the happy meal with the toy, right? So I have that memory. And it's still, still till today, if I have a great accomplishment, I'll go to dinner or I'll have some, um, some kind of treat. So I think that we can agree that foods associated definitely with emotions. Next slide. So we, you guys have kind of um, gotten a crash course on this hormone cortisol. We've talked about the stress hormone and um, basically our body's um, response to acute or immediate forms of stress, we get elevated cortisol levels. Um, and that's good, right? It helps us with our flight or fight or flight response. Um, but we, we also see it in its um, connection to food and our hunger hormones. So when we have chronic stress over time, we have elevated levels of cortisol, prolonged elevated levels of cortisol. We see that um, directly in relation to our hunger hormones, which are leptin, that's the one that tells us that we're full. It decreases that hormone over time if it's, if it's um, elevated, prolonged. And then um, an increase in our hunger hormone, ghrelin, um, which tells us that we have an appetite. So with elevated levels of cortisol, we see more ghrelin, less leptin. We also see cravings for foods high in fat and sugar, which we know leads to weight gain. Um, and we also know that we tend to lean more towards carbohydrates, right? Um, as comfort foods because it gives us that quick brush of sugar um, and also uh, affects our serotonin levels or our happy feel-good hormone. We also see cortisol levels um, in conjunction with abdominal belly fat or things like insulin resistance that lead to development of chronic disease like diabetes. Next slide, please. And I apologize if you hear anything in the background. I'm in clinic, so I'm in between, in between patients. Um, so how do we tell um, if we're stress eating, right? What's the difference between emotional hunger versus physical hunger? So signs that this is emotional hunger and not true hunger. Um, emotional hunger comes on very quickly. It, it's pretty immediate, not gradual. 
emotional hunger feels like I need to eat something right now. It needs to be satisfied in the moment, right? Um, emotional hunger also looks at specific cravings. So you're in the mood for a specific food, not a balanced plate. You don't want a salad. You don't want anything that's put in front of you. I want pizza. I want ice cream. I want a specific cra craving. That's more so emotional hunger. Um, emotional hunger isn't satisfied with a full stomach. So you're not really listening to your um, full or hunger cues, right? You're like, mm, I feel kind of satisfied, but I still want a little more. It still tastes good. I still want more. Um, and then emotional hunger, unlike physical hunger, typically leaves you feeling with uh, feeling um, feelings of guilt or shame or hmm, maybe I shouldn't have eaten that. Maybe I ate too much of that. Did I really need that? Um, so those are signs that you're stressed eating. Next slide, please. So I've identified that I probably have been stress eating. How do I manage stress eating? Great question. So um, the biggest tip, and it's something that you've also heard with our um, previous uh, panelists, is mindful eating. So practicing mindful eating, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, to curb your cravings, choosing healthier alternatives. We'll also talk about that. Um, snacking on fruits and vegetables, foods that are higher in fiber and protein, things that keep you fuller longer. Um, kind of give you more nutrition bang for your buck versus the highly processed foods that kind of give you that quick sugar rush and then you're left feeling hungry soon after. Remove temptation. So if you know what your kind of junk food treat is or what your your um, bottom of the bag uh, bag of chips is, keep that away from the house if you think you, you're um, going to be tempted by it. And then keep a food diary. So I counsel a lot of my patients to do this if stress and um, food is, is related or emotions and food is related. Um, and so you're writing down what you eat, how you feel at the time, were you hungry, um, how you felt afterwards, things like that. Using portion control. Um, I always recommend not to deprive yourself, right? Because that's how we kind of start on things like binge episodes um, or binge eating if we deprive ourselves of the little treats. It's all about moderation and portion control. And then developing stress redu reduction techniques like um, our panelists talked about today. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about mindful eating. Mindful eating is a practice um, that supports thoughtful, thoughtfulness, awareness surrounding your eating. And when I first was learning about mindful eating, um, the instructors would use like a piece of fruit, for example, like an apple, and have you take a look at the apple, take a look at the color of the apple. Is it red? Is it green? Is it a little bit of both? Um, what's the shape of the apple? This is all before you can eat it, right? So what's the shape of the apple? Does it have any dents? And does it have any damage or bruises on it? Where do we think this apple was grown from, right? And then you take a bite, and you take a small bite, and you use all your senses, and you think about, um, is this, how does the apple taste? Is it tart? Is it sweet? Um, is it crunchy? Is it soft? Um, and so the practice of mindful eating is very extensive and thorough, um, but it makes you slow down. And so some tips that I have uh, for mindful eating is to first check in with your hunger. Am I really hungry? Am I, am I just experiencing one of those emotions like boredom and loneliness? Um, am I starving? Am I, am I super hungry? You should never go to a meal ravenous, right? Because then we're not making um, great decisions at that point. And then once you've checked in with your hunger, you want to take inventory of your food, appreciate the food that, that's in front of you. Um, and it may sound a little goofy at first, but it really does work. Looking at if um, your plate is balanced. Do, do I have vegetables on this plate? Do I have fruits? Is my plate colorful? Is it just bland? Um, things like that. And then eliminating distractions. I think we all can agree we are guilty of this at one point in time. I know I can. Um, eating while driving, eating while watching TV, eating while on the computer or during your lunch break, um, and not really just taking a moment to sit with your food um, and take your time with your food. Typically, when we're, we're sitting in front of the TV and eating, we're gobbling down food, and we look down, and it's gone, and we're done, and we want more, right? So just eliminating those distractions so that you take time with eating. Take small bites and chew your foods completely and thoroughly. Eat slowly. Some um, mindful eating practitioners suggest putting down your fork or your utensil between um, every other bite so that you're taking time. Using all your senses while eating, appreciating the, the, what your food looks like, what it tastes like, what it smells like, and really, really listening to your body and stopping when full. 
So mindful eating has been shown to really reduce overeating um, and kind of combat some of, some of the stress eating. Next slide, please. Okay. So of course we have to have a curbing and craving slide, right? So um, I've listed a couple of snack ideas to substitute for um, the most common kind of cra cravings, whether it be sweet, salty, or savory. I also want to mention um, substituting cravings with healthier behaviors. So we don't always crave because we're hungry, right? We just want to snack on something. So really checking in with your hunger. Am I bored? Do I want to, am I snacking just to fill the time? Can I do a healthier activity in this time? Something you like to do, go for a walk. Um, hang out with some friends, call a friend, read, write, listen to music. Try to challenge yourself to find activities that don't involve food um, and go with that if you're not really hungry. And then um, a little note on portion control. So um, I'm definitely not here. I'm, I'm not the kind of dietitian that um, recommends completely um, taking out any kind of foods within a balanced diet. So you're always going to hear me talk about um, my plate. I hope everybody's heard about my plate by now, um, but I counsel a lot of my uh, patients with this. And it's basically a way to look at your plate every time you sit down and eat. And am I having all food groups on my plate in balanced portions? So half your plate should be fruits and vegetables when you sit down most times. And the other half split between grains or carbohydrates and your protein. Um, that's what a balanced plate looks like. So try to challenge yourself when you sit down for your meals. Does my plate look balanced? Um, I also put up a hand guide for portion control. So if we are having, you just want to have that, that um, bowl of pasta or you want to have some of that ice cream, think about portion sizes, right? So we know that a, the front of your fist is half a cup, a full fist here is a, is a cup. Your hand, if you look at the palm of your hand here, that's a good size for your protein, about five to six ounces. Um, and so using this kind of method, when you're sitting down to eat, you can kind of keep control of the portion sizes. Next slide. This, I think this is my last slide. So, um, Melody, I've tried all the tips and tricks that you um, told me to try. I still feel like I'm dealing with stress eating. You might want to consider checking in with your physician or healthcare provider. There could be a medical condition that's affecting your appetite. Um, some kind of hormonal imbalance or some like a thyroid disease, for example. You definitely may want to consider therapy or counseling. So check in with a mental health provider um, because we do know that uh, food is really rooted in a lot of emotions and especially childhood experiences like we've heard about today. Um, and seek nutrition guidance, guidance, ways to kind of incorporate healthier foods and to deal with some of these um, cravings and uh, dietary patterns during these high stress periods. So seek out a registered dietitian. You can go to eatright.org. I'll leave that information um, with our panel today. And I hope that this was helpful today. And short and sweet. Thank you, Miss Melody. We've got a lot of information about uh, stress eating, how we should avoid it, how we can alleviate the problems. And to be quite honest with you, as a clinician, diet plays a very strong role in remaining healthy and um, fighting inflammation that leads to chronic stress and vascular changes that contribute to the development of hypertension and other things that cause problems with your brain. For all of you, thank you for joining us. Um, we do have a um, question. We'd like you to forward your questions to the Q&A or the, excuse me, the chat feature, but this is officially the end of our program. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We will be on for a few more minutes and those of us that are available will try to answer the questions you pose in the chat. Thank you all for joining this program uh, for the Community Cares Program Foundation from the Alpha Kappa Alpha chapter, as well as the Emory Boisweta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So, Thank you. Thank you all for your attendance. And to our presenters, thank you for your presentations and your wisdom. Thank you.